Hi, Ling. Hi, Reva. How are you? I'm well. How are you? First of all, I have to ask, are you outside right now? I'm in Minnesota. There's snow on the ground. It's freezing cold. I have to put on multiple layers to go outside. And I'm a little bit jealous because you look like you're someplace that you can be outside and the air doesn't hurt your face. No, it does not. It is currently like 75 degrees and sunny in Houston right now. So move to oh. Houston. Yes, yes, move to Houston. Yeah. Oh, I'm jealous. Well, I'm glad you're able to be outside. Um, I have just enjoyed getting to know you so much, just a little bit through reading your essays, um, seeing your pictures, and having some conversation with you. Um, and I just am beginning to develop a feel for what an amazing person, an amazing human being you are. So I thought I'd maybe just ask you a couple of questions um, so I get to know you better and continue to do that, but also so that my community, who's going to get to know you really well on the 26th of February through Share the Mic, um, gets a feel for, for who you are. So um, I just have a couple of questions and we'll see where the conversation takes us. Does that sound good? Sounds wonderful. Okay, Thank great. You. All right. Well, first question, can you tell me a little bit about kind of your childhood? Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? What was that like? Yeah, so I was born uh, in really, really southern China. So like, think really close to the Vietnam border. Um, and while I was in China, I suffered, uh, they think, uh, near starvation and nearly died. Um, and uh, that uh, left an impact on my muscular system and uh, neurological system. So uh, my condition looks a lot like polio. Um, it isn't polio, but it looks very much similar to it. Um, and so I was a special needs adoption and I came to the US um, with some amazing American parents. They're great. Um, uh, around the age of two and grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I have been a lifelong patient at Gillette Children's um, where I've been treated and I've seen so many people. I do therapy there, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, and they've been just a wonderful community, literally getting me up on my feet. Um, I use a wheelchair, uh, electric power chair for long distances, but I do have walking braces and uh, I can do some short distance uh, walking and can move around, you know, inside rooms and houses and stuff. And um, they've been just fantastic. So that's like sort of very backstory. Um, I went to uh, Mounds Park Academy for elementary, middle and upper school, high school. Um, so like lifelong MPA -er. Um And that was a great community, um, you know, really inclusive, small knit. Um, and they were always, you know, just, I, it was, you know, my physical challenge were never an issue there. Um, and they're always accommodating and it was really a place for me to thrive um, as a young kid. So that was, that was childhood. Um, That's yeah. incredible. That's incredible. And every time we talk, I find more and more connections. I actually came to this country when I was two as well. I was born in India um, in a small village called Kaur. Uh, it's in the south of India uh, and came to the country when I was was two. And then um, you mentioned children's. I'm uh, uh, My son was treated at Children's Hospital for a couple of years and we had a similar incredible experience with the staff and the care he was given at Children's. I was a relatively new mom and was um, really scared uh, to have my young child in this situation. And they were so great at helping our entire family, not just the patient yeah. with kind of everything we needed to be set up for, for success. So um, children's like is a smaller it. part of our yeah. life. I like part of it. it. Yeah, I like to call it the village that raised me. I mean, there's oh. so many people that, you know, fill this village and, um, you know, I I could name so many of them, but I can't name all of them off the top of my head. But there's so many people that made me who I am. Um, and I think that's like the big thing that I want to give back to the community um, and make sure that we are partnership, but also we like, you know, encourage other people to be you know, villages for other people and to, you know, help people and to, you know, make them the best that they can be. Okay. Be a village for others. That yeah, is village. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just wrote that down. Like that's my new mantra. That is, that's very cool. So, so now we know a little bit about kind of how you grew up um, and um, some of the challenges you faced, but also the beauty of this village who accepted you and helped make you the amazing young person that you are. So tell us where you are today. And I'm especially fascinated by your double major and the left and right side of your brain that I think are working beautifully in tandem, which is by the way, a rarity for most of us. So kind of tell us where you are today. Yeah, so right now I am a sophomore at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Um, I'm on a dual degree program where I'm doing a, a bachelor's of science in evolutionary biology, but then I'm also doing a bachelor's of arts in visual fine arts. Um, so yes, very much art and science oriented. I, I have to have both. I can't just be one. Um, and what that looks like in the future is, you know, combining the two, how how do we use art to view science? What do we love? What do we hate? What do we, you know, what's ethical? What do we reject? But also, I think art is a catalyst for asking science's biggest questions and saying, you know, like, how, how do we visualize data? How do we communicate it to the world? Um, and so I think there's so many overlaps between the two subjects. Um, and so my dream is to bring those two subjects together into some sort of creation idea. Um, I don't know. I don't know what exists out there yet. Um, you know, the amazing thing is, I don't know that it does exist. And I yeah. think you're going to create it, which is, I've never heard of and I've never thought about art as a catalyst for science. I think so often we think about it maybe the other way around, that it all starts with science, that it starts with data, that it starts with knowledge. And from that, you know, so many things bloom. But the idea of art as a catalyst for science is kind of flipping a switch for me. Um, and I do think whatever you're going to do in the future, I don't know that it's been discovered yet, which is really incredible to think about the impact you can have if you can do something that no one else has done. And I think you're someone who has that kind of potential, which is so cool. And I can say I knew her when, in fact, I now have video proof yep. that I knew Ling uh, when she was just a college student uh, trying to, to work all of this out. And you know what? I should ask you, Ling, yeah. um, your pronouns, your preferred pronouns, mine are she, her, hers. What are yours? Same. Mine, she, she, her, hers. Okay. I just used her and I thought, you know what? Before I make no, an no, assumption, no, that's I should, right. it's right. I should it's ask for sure. Um, okay. So we know a little bit about childhood. We know kind of where you are um, today. And we've actually talked about a little bit of unknown in the future. Um, what is this, this, this passion? How are you going to pursue it? I'm confident you're going to make a difference. You know, if you think about the message you want to share with um, people who maybe don't know you, who, who don't understand your background, your perspective, the, you know, what you want to put out into the universe, you know, I have followers who don't know you um, and who maybe haven't been exposed um, to some of the things that you're talking about, living with a disability, um, being in a wheelchair, um, being a woman, being a, an Asian woman, and the intersectional nature of, of who you are. Um, so with all of that in mind, you know, what are some of the key things, and don't limit yourself, um, no, say as many as you want to that you want people to know about you and your lived experience? I think I'm going to put this into like a future lens and see if we can like build, build a better, better world, like an ideal, like what, what, what the future should look like kind of, kind of such a scenario. But um, I think I kind of see it as like, I am all of these different identities, you know, yes, I, I am, you know, I have a neuromuscular disability, I use a wheelchair, I'm a woman, I'm a woman in STEM, which is still, you know, a frontier that we're still growing, we're building on that still needs to be, you know, broken down in some areas. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, and then also just, you know, like as a woman, as an Asian woman, too, I think we also have, like, you know, my culture, my heritage, but like, I'm an American too, but I'm, you know, I was born not in the United States. So, you know, what does this mean? I'm an immigrant. I came to this country. There's so many, all of these pieces are parts of my identity. And so what I want to do, I think in the future is to use all of these aspects and to, I guess, you know, tell people 
people, you know, listen and like be open to listening to our stories and I guess just create, and this maybe goes back to the village, but be a person that is open to all of your different stories and all of these different like parts of you um, and really like be the person that lets other people thrive. Because I think like when we're all thriving, um, we can do so much more together. Um, and so like concretely, I'm not exactly sure like what that might look like, but um, I don't know. I think it's just like, how, how do we share our experiences and our stories with each other? And then how does that broaden our worldview and make us more accepting of each other and like how does that inspire collaboration to you know solve the world's greatest greatest challenges i i think that's fantastic and i actually think that's what share the mic is all and about. the partnership with the women's foundation is all about is thinking about how do we create more space more place more platforms for more voices because so often today in the media we don't see ourselves and I'll, I'll, I'll say that I don't see myself. And for years, I'll tell you a funny story, Lane. Um, I remember watching um, this movie, uh, you might not have seen it before, but it was called Bend It Like Beckham. Yeah. And, yeah, and it was, um, it was about an Indian mm-hmm. family in London, I believe, in England. Yeah. And um, I watched it and I, I was like laughing, I was crying. My, I could see my aunties and my uncles. I recognized the food. I, I, I knew jokes in that movie that like the people around me weren't laughing at because they weren't Indian. And I was like, and I turned to the people that I was with and I said, and it was a group of white people. And I said, is that how you feel every time you see a movie? Like the movies reflect you and your your culture and it was the first time and it was like well into my teens maybe even my early 20s that I saw my family reflected on a screen that you know that lots of people in America were were watching and seeing and I just remember that moment they I think they call it on Twitter um the first time I saw me that moment for so many of us where we go oh that could be me and I don't typically see that reinforce the way some other people do in our culture. So I think this is what Share the Mic is really about is to give you that platform to say, here's who I am in all of its breadth and depth, not just one aspect of it, which I think from an intersectional lens gets really challenging for us is that people want to simplify you down to one thing. They want to say, oh, Ling is the, the Asian woman I know or Ling is the woman that I know that's in a wheelchair, or Ling is the scientist, or Ling is the artist, and you are all of those things. And how do you share that story? And I love your your comment about that empowers other people to also share their stories, because I think that's also what Share the Mic is about, is saying, I'm doing this, I'm taking a risk, right? You're you're taking a risk in, in sharing your story and opening yourself up. Um, and I really do appreciate you doing that, but hopefully that will inspire others to to do the same. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, I think exactly, you, I think you hit it, right? Um, exactly how it should be said. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I think it's just how do we amplify intersectional voices and how do we normalize um, intersectional identities and say, you know, we're not just one thing. We are so many things. We are all of our lived experiences. We are our childhoods. We are, you know, our college life. We are, you know, what we're afraid of, where we're going. Mm-hmm. How, you know, we're, we're all of these different pieces and how, how does that shape our identities? And how does that, what are the similarities between me and you? I mean, there's so many similarities, I think, between the two of us. Um, and so I think that's just so empowering to be, you know, we're in this together and we're going forward together. Yeah, and there are so, so many similarities and yet there's always those differences. And I am drawn to wanting to learn about those differences. You know, life in a wheelchair, life with a physical disability. Um, these are things that are not familiar to me. And it's one of the reasons I appreciate knowing you is I think in hearing your stories and hearing your experience and, and by the way, sharing that, um, it, it will help others realize 
both the things we have in common and the things that we don't understand. And you use the word, I think, empathy, like getting to know someone's experience, their lived experience that's different from yours creates empathy. And I think empathy is the mother of kindness. Empathy is the mother of collaboration and understanding. And like you said, problem solving without empathy, we can't solve problems. So I, I think there's an element of empathy. One of the things I know we do share though, is a passion for removing the stigma associated with mental health. Um, we've talked about that. I told you that I use every platform I can, including this one, to talk about my own experience with mental health, my family's experience with mental health. And every time I do, people come up to me and they say, thank you so much for talking about mental health because we don't talk about it enough. And everyone experiences um, a mental health issue in their lives at some time or another. And it's not a sign of weakness, it's actually a sign of strength. It's a sign that you've been strong for so long. And just like any other part of your body, your brain sometimes um, needs to give a little bit. Um, and and you know that looks different for different people. But I'm kind of curious about your, your mental health journey and experience um, and what you wanna share in terms of being an advocate for removing the stigma of mental health. Yeah, no, mental health is a big, I think, topic that has been growing over the past couple of years. And I think it's great that we're coming out and we're starting to, you know, recognize it and again, normalize it and say, you know, mental health is just as important as our physical health. Um, and really, I think that's also like good for us taking care of ourselves, learning more about ourselves, you know, our limits, our boundaries. And I think you're absolutely right that it is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. But I think one of the hardest things and um, like detrimental, harmful things about mental health is we're so stuck in an old idea of it, in a old, you know, we think of it as, uh, you know, a non-functional member of society where, you know, we're, we're not out, we're out and about, you know, we can't, there's this divide between, you know, if I'm bubbly and happy and social and successful on the outside, then, you know, I, I, I don't have any problems with my mental health. And I think that one, especially for women in the workforce, I think that one is so huge and it plays so much to our image and, you know, everything about like what we look like, how we act. And, and so I think breaking that down and saying, you know, sometimes, some days I just need to, you know, take a mental health day or, um, I think probably the bigger one is just knowing that it's okay to ask for help when you need it and to not shut down inside, but to take that leap and to say, I need help. That, that was, that's the biggest thing. I think that we, we should talk about more and we should make more, um, more normal. I'll never forget after having my um, second child. Um, I, I just remember I had postpartum with my first, but I don't think to your point, I wanted to admit it. Um, I kind of knew that something wasn't right, but as someone who, you know, successful in career, first time being a mom, had to be a great mom, the best mom, you know, it, there was a fear to it. And I remember after having my second child, my, my mother and my sister were with me and it was a few weeks after I had Jacob. And I remember like just that same feeling of like, something's not right. Like I'm sad on the inside and I don't know why and it's getting worse. And I remember my mother and my sister pulling them together and actually saying to them, something's wrong and I need help. And they were amazing. And both of them have mental health issues as well. And so, you know, they instantly said all the right things. Thank you so much. And, you know, they helped, find, helped me find a support group and the resources that I need, but your point is such a good one for so many of us, especially successful women. I think there's, um, there's an expectation that you said really well of if I'm good at my job, if I'm good at these things, everything must be okay. And I have to say to society, oh, everything's okay. Even in the midst of a pandemic where half a million people in our country have died. And in the midst of uh, civil unrest, and anti-racism efforts that I don't know about you, but I'm like, yes, we're talking about this in the boardroom. We're actually making, I think we have the potential to make real progress after 400 plus years. But you know, through all of that, so many of us think we're supposed to show up on every Zoom call, perfectly put together, 
lipstick on, you know, Bubbly, all the right things. Yep. Right. And it's just not anyone's reality. So let's break down that reality. I, I tell my team a lot. I tell a lot of people I'm a mess in a dress most days. I'm like, on the surface, it all looks good, but go one level below and there's just a mess in there. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we talked about it. And um, I'm glad that that um, I, I do think your generation is better at talking about it than mine was, is. Yep. I also think too, though, my generation though has so many different social pressures too, like so many media and like, you know, feedback that like, it's so image, like social image conscious. That I think that's also really something to balance out too. Like there's, there's the professional work side, but I think there's also this like, how do I look in front of my friends? And like, I need validation from all these different, you know, outlets. Mm. And then it's like, what is, what does this mean? Um, yeah. And then be not being able to see that in person within the pandemic, I think is also that something hard to, you know, rationalize too. How do you manage that thing? How do you manage that pressure? from kind of social media and this idea of similar to what we were just talking about. Like you always have to be kind of on and be in the right place with the right people doing the right things. Has that ever been a challenge for you or a pressure for you? Or do you just somehow magically rise above? Um, I am not that much on social media. So my LinkedIn is actually, this is, this is interesting. I was like, Ooh, LinkedIn, I get to build my LinkedIn space. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I have, I think my go-to is Instagram, but um, other than that, um, I have like a tiny YouTube channel, um, which is mostly just for like storing big video files and school stuff. Um, but I think to take a break from it, um, Instagram is definitely one, and I mean, I guess there's, there's, there's a dark monster side to this too, but for me, it's being able to like artistically put out there and like curate different um, parts of you know what I think is beautiful what you know it like, speaks to me um so I really like that part um but I guess I think you know like the Instagram curation you know we're, we're also making these fake almost fake identities of like what we want our life to look like and then you know pretending that we have to live up to that in in reality in real life which I think is hard um but I I think for me I haven't had too much of an issue with it um I think it's mostly just like stepping back and just being like if I like it I like it and if other people don't like it you know that's okay too like just be one of my yeah yeah I think that's great I did my kids just um a while ago told me about finsta your fake oh, yes. all the fake Insta? Insta accounts yeah and I was like okay I can't barely keep up with you know your your normal instas much normal less insta, insta. Right. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite quotes, um, Lane, that I'll share with you because I wish I had learned it so much earlier, um, is a quote by a woman whose whose name I'm not gonna get right. And maybe we can find it and I'll maybe I'll put this up on my LinkedIn um as part of our our um our yeah. sharing the mic on Friday. Um the quote is uh the woman who does not need validation is the most feared person on the planet. And I have to tell you, I have that on a sign in my office, not my home office. I should actually get it for my home office. It's in my work office, which I haven't seen in a while. But, um, and I, I have it up as a reminder to myself of how powerful we become when we don't need validation. We don't need validation from anyone um, where we think, you know, I am doing the work I want to do the way that I want to do it. Um, and I don't need anyone to tell me that what I'm doing is right or to tell me what I'm saying is valid. And, you know, it's so interesting. I think women, men, you know, regardless, we grow up wanting validation. The world tells us that our success is about validation. When you can move that validation inside, um, that is, it is an incredibly powerful tool. I'm not great at it. Um, and I keep that side of my office for those moments where, I'm not good at it. And then I look at that quote and I think, okay, Brava, like you got to work on this because I do think when we stop working for validation and stop working or start working because it's the right thing, because the work and the people that we serve deserve it, 
it's like a whole different life. It opens up a whole different level of courage, um, of, of confidence. Um, and so I will share that on Friday as part of our, our uh, dialogue, or maybe even before, um, because I come back to that quote time and time again, and I hope you find something in it as well. I do. That's a great quote. Post it. I think it'll, I will. Too. It'll, it'll, it'll be great. It'll, it's yes, inspiration. Here's your daily inspiration. This, yes, and like, be, I just have to tell you one thing. Self. Oh, yes. go ahead, sorry. No, I just be, be your authentic self. Be you. Yes. 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 Okay, I have to tell you one thing before we close. Um, I had yeah. posted your picture um, on LinkedIn as part of the Women's Foundation and Share the Mic. Yes. And um, saying how excited I was to, to share the mic with you. And your mom posted and was yes. like, that's my daughter. Yes, she did. It was so cool. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 My daughter turns 21 tomorrow. And I thought that is so what I would do as a mom. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her happy birthday. I will. I will. That's it's a great big to birthday. see you. It is a big birthday. Yeah. She's, you know, she's not a partier okay. as far as I know. Cause I said, oh, we can have a glass of wine together. And she looked at me and she said, I'll have Sprite, thanks. And I went, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Lynn, it is um, always such a pleasure to connect with you. I have learned so much from you. I wrote down a whole bunch of notes. Um, just in our short time together, you're challenging me, challenging me to think differently, to think bigger. And I'm so excited to share the mic with you on Friday, February 26th. I think it's going to be a blast. It's going to be so much fun. Thank you, Reva, so much for listening. It's so good to, you know, hear from you and to make connections like these. And hopefully our little step forward, our partnership will bring so much, so many more people with us and empower so many others. Perfect. Thank you so much.